So we're still going to be looking at the ratio test today. Uh, so we haven't done, um, aside from Grandy's series, which diverges, we haven't seen any series with both positive and negative terms. Um, for the first few sections, when we were looking at the comparison tests and the integral test, I mean, neither of those tests work if you have negative terms, the ratio test does. You can have negative terms and the ratio test still works. And what you see a lot in, um, in some quite important applications, which we'll get to involving the sine and cosine, but you see a lot of series that start at zero. You see a lot of series with something like that in them, a negative number raised to a power, and then, then whatever you have, um, n, Fact or n squared over n factorial or whatever. And what the negative one to the n does is cause the terms of the series to alternate between being positive and being negative. So our first term is a zero. Might look like it should be giving us a division by zero error, but actually a zero factorial is one. So we can stick zero in there, no problem. And negative one to the power of zero is <laughs> positive one. Then we count up, we let n be one next, and negative one to the first is negative one. Then we count up, we let n be two, Sorry, I said positive one, I think. I meant negative one. Negative one to the first is negative one. And then we count up, we let n be two, and negative one squared is positive one. We count up, and at this point we can probably stop because the pattern has emerged. N is three, negative one cubed is negative one. So these, when you just see them without any context, I think those um, series look very artificial, like, these negative ones to powers, or sometimes you have something other than one, negative three to a power or whatever. But what they're doing is causing the series to alternate between positive and negative terms. And we'll see some very important applications where we want to do exactly that. It's always a bit, um, the way the, this material is structured is always a bit awkward, just because we don't do applications until maybe section 10.10. So a lot of chapter 10 is promising that applications will come in the future. Um, Let's investigate the convert question. Excuse me, do we have a division by zero if n is equal to zero? Uh, we do not. 
because zero factorial is defined to be one. Thank you. So that's, I just made this up, but let's try to, uh, try to use this uh, series as our next example. It's our first example where we have these negative terms. And let's try to investigate whether this converges or diverges using the um, ratio test. <laughs> Um, my intuition is that this probably converges because n factorial is such a fast growing function. Like these terms converging to zero doesn't tell you anything. But that n factorial is going to cause these terms to converge to zero really, really quickly. Um, well, the good thing about the ratio test, though, is that even though I'm trying to form some kind of intuition, we don't really need it. The ratio test is completely plug and play. We'll take the fraction, we'll take the limit, and then we'll look at whether that limit is less than one or greater than one. No intuition required. And here, these absolute value signs are going to be really important. In the two examples we did yesterday, we didn't forget about them, but we did at the end of the problem say, well, these absolute value signs aren't doing anything. Everything's already positive. Here, of course, everything is not already positive. We have those negative terms. So the absolute values are going to be very important. And there's no way we are finishing this on this frame. But let's see if I can at least write down the action that we're looking at. So the denominator, when we use the ratio test, is just the terms of the series unchanged. The numerator replaces all of the ends. with n plus one. And then it's always this sort of algebraic exercise. We've got to, um, got to multiply by the reciprocal of that denominator to clear this, uh, to clear this fraction. And, even though, I mean, the way this is written, you have a negative one to the end in front of the fraction. You can, because you can think of this as being itself divided by one. You can think of these negatives as being in the numerator of these smaller fractions. And now, as I say, we're going to divide, not divide, we're going to multiply 
by the reciprocal of that bottom fraction to clear the denominator. And let's uh, do this piece by piece. Let me, well, let me write this down. And let's sort of go piece by piece here. We've got this numerator, negative one to the n plus one. times n plus one squared over n plus one factorial. And now we're multiplying by the reciprocal of this fraction down here that I have circled. So the reciprocal of this the denominator becomes the numerator, and the numerator becomes the denominator. And now we're supposed to take this limit. And taking the limit as this thing currently exists would be a hopeless ask, um, we've got to try to simplify stuff. And the simplification is always done along similar lines, which is that if you look at these fractions, each of them has similar terms. So each of these fractions has a negative one to a power. Each of these fractions has something being squared. And each of these fractions has a factorial. And we're just going to move terms around. We can do that when we're multiplying. And we're going to move the like terms over each other. So we're going to take this negative one to the n, and we're going to move it so that it's below the negative one to a power. And we're going to take the n squared and we're going to move it so it's below the n plus one squared. And we're going to take the factorial, the n plus one factorial, and we are going to move it so that it's below the n factorial. And now we're basically going to look at these as three separate problems. We'll simplify those. We'll look at this. And we'll look at that. And we'll see how each of those expressions I've circled simplifies, if they simplify. So that's, we're discovering kind of the downside, or at least the reality of, um, of this stuff which is that there's a lot of algebra, a lot of messing around and canceling stuff. Um, I don't know, I mean, you've seen absolute values before, certainly. Um, 
I don't know how well you remember the properties of an absolute value. Um, the absolute value, well, let, let, me, let me simplify just one by one, and then we'll talk about what the absolute value is going to do. So when we have, looking at this first thing I've circled, um, when we have a common base, so we've got one power divided by another power and the bases are the same, then that division is done by subtracting the powers, taking the n from the n plus one. And n plus one minus n is one. So let's make that line be thicker. So we get a negative one to the first hour. And all of this is still inside an absolute value. Um, n plus one squared over n squared doesn't really simplify. Let me just copy it down for now. And again, I, it's probably a mistake to just rush through the algebra because you haven't seen the algebra in a while, maybe. So let me say this explicitly, that when you've got a fraction and everything in the top is being multiplied and everything in the bottom is being multiplied, that fraction can be broken up as the product of fractions. So we're looking at these fractions one by one. And now this is going to simplify. A factorial divided by a factorial should simplify in some way. And I always have to write this stuff down. I always find it difficult to do in my head. Maybe you find it easier, but let's remind ourselves that n factorial is n times n minus one times n minus two until we reach one. I mean, this definition makes zero factorial equal Equaling one, extremely mysterious, but um, it is the definition. And then n plus one factorial, well, we start with n plus one, and we count down to one, and just about everything cancels. Just gonna do this every time. Change my pen width. Well, whatever, the n's cancel, the n minus one's cancel, the n minus two's cancel, mass cancellation, The only thing that doesn't 
Uh, so is that term in the denominator, the n plus one? And we're taking the limit of this. Let's finally deal. We could keep working inside the absolute values, but let's deal with the absolute values at this point. And the result I want to use, let's clear all of this, is that if you have a bunch of stuff being multiplied inside of absolute values, that's the same as having a bunch of absolute values being multiplied. The absolute value of a product is the product of the absolute values. So here, the absolute value of a product is the product of the absolute values. So we've got an absolute value times an absolute value times an absolute value. And two thirds of these absolute values aren't doing anything. Remember that an absolute value is just making an expression positive. So if you have the absolute if you have the absolute value of a positive number, it's not doing anything. You might as well not have the absolute values. And this is what we have over here in two of the three cases. Remember that N is positive. N starts at zero and it's going to positive infinity. So N is positive, N plus one is positive. Everything in that fraction is positive. The absolute values don't do anything. Uh, the middle fraction likewise. Um, n plus one squared is positive. N squared is positive. Those middle absolute values aren't doing anything. Um, negative one to the first is negative one. These absolute values are doing something, but we can just write that the absolute value of negative one is positive one. We don't have to keep the bars there. We can just take the absolute value. And then one times something isn't doing anything, so we can erase it. And we've significantly, uh, let me copy this limit so it's not like a third of the screen away. We've done, we haven't actually done calculus step. We haven't taken the limit. It's my opinion though that the calculus is usually the least difficult part of these problems. Um, we have successfully simplified
simplified this expression. We have simplified a sub n plus one over a sub n. Woof, that was, that was a lot. Um, I guess it's kind of late in the day to ask this, but does anybody have any questions about any of the steps we performed to go from here to here to here before we finally ended up there. then we need to take this limit. And uh, there are a few ways, I guess, we could go about this. Um, we could think of this as one limit, or we could think of this as two limits, is I guess kind of the, the choice we make. So by that, I mean, The limit of a product is the product of the limits. So we could look at each of these fractions separately. And multiply the limits together. Or we could do this as a single limit, the limit as n goes to infinity of n plus one squared over, and then we multiply the denominator, n cubed plus n squared. And there's not a lot, I mean, I'm phrasing this as a question. Excuse me, can we simplify? Uh, we could simplify, yeah. There's some, um, I mean, n plus one, n plus one, that would maybe, let me rewrite this. n squared, n plus one. And if we write it that way, then the simplification that you're looking at, that um, that this n plus one and that n plus one cancel becomes more obvious. Um, in the, at the end of the day, it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, all of these are valid. This is valid. This is valid. If you forget to simplify, that's also valid. You might end up using L'Hopital's rule, or you might not, depending on questions like, do you remember, do you see that that simplifies? But this limit is going to be zero. I mean, let's um, let's take it, and because we have we have to make a choice, let's just take n plus one squared over n squared. And let's take one over n plus one. And let's just look at these. My instinct is to just think of these as two limits. 
one over n plus one is going to zero as n goes to infinity. Then n squared plus two n plus one almost has to be some bug with the zoom that suddenly my pen length keeps uh, being reduced. As n goes to infinity, you can you can hit this with Lopetau's rule a few times. Uh, my my notation is awful here, but I hope it's clear what I mean. Um, if you hit this with Lopetau's rule a few times. This thing goes to one and one times zero is zero. And now, uh, finally, after this, this half hour problem, but we're done, um, well, I guess we're not technically done because we haven't answered the actual question, which was, does this thing converge or does it diverge? We need to remember what the ratio test is saying, which is that you look at this limit and it's either less than one or greater than one or it's equal to one, which would be bad. If it equaled one, the ratio test would fail. But zero is less than one. And the ratio test tells us that this thing converges. And now I need to, what can I do? Problem is I don't want to do another half hour example, but I don't want to just dismiss class so early either. Why don't we? It's going to have you do it stuff, but if we then want to go over it in class, that's like seven minutes for you to do the problem and seven minutes for me to go over it. Let's just. We've looked at cases where the ratio test um, gives us convergence. We've looked at cases where it gives us divergence. Let's try to look kind of quickly at a case where it doesn't give us anything. So when I look at this series, I think the limit comparison test. Um, the limit comparison test is tailor made for working with algebraic expressions. I think if you compare this to, um, well, I don't think the limit comparison test I mean, that was my first thought. I wasn't lying to you. Now that I look at this a little more closely, I think, oh, this is the easiest thing in the world because as n goes to infinity, this limit isn't zero. So even the limit comparison test is unnecessary. We can hit this with the nth. Term test. And the nth term test tells us 
well, the limit isn't going to zero, so this is not convergent. This is divergent. But what happens if we hit it with if we hit it with the ratio test. The limit as n goes to infinity, and then in the denominator, we've got this fraction, and in the numerator, we've got all of the ends replaced with n plus ones. And um, we'll take this limit as n goes to infinity and we'll see what happens. And the simplification is always essentially the same. You always take that denominator and multiply by its reciprocal. Probably slow down a bit, give people time to write. Um, so we're taking the limit as n goes to infinity, then n plus one plus two is n plus three divided by, let's see, two n plus two plus seven. So at the moment, I'm just taking taking this numerator and simplifying it a little. Now we'll multiply by the reciprocal of the denominator. So the reciprocal of this two n plus seven over n plus and um, I don't think I keep like missing cancellations, but I don't think there's any cancellation or anything nice happening here. I think there's not much to do but multiply these out. Remembering. <clears throat> remembering to foil appropriately. Uh, in the top, 2n squared, let's see, plus 7n plus 6n plus 13n plus 21. In the bottom, 2n squared plus, uh, let's see, 4n plus 9n, 13n plus 18. And then I'm going to let the absolute values be. Yeah. Um, because without thinking about it a little, it's not totally obvious that everything in these absolute values is going to be positive. But we can take the limit as we normally do. Um, it's just that we'll have these absolute values there. So this is, infinity over infinity, it's indeterminate, it's L'Hopital's rule. 
So, and now only had to use Wilbertow's rule once. That's nice. Um, the absolute value of one is one, and the limit is one. And um, and this failed. This um, gives us one, the ratio test fails. And in general, I mean, you can always try the ratio test. The worst thing that can possibly happen is that you can't take the limit or the limit is one and the test fails and then you have to try something else. But I mean, the reason this fails, I think, speaking a little informally, is that nothing really cancels here. The ratio test usually relies on a bunch of stuff canceling, like here, the powers so what's negative one to a power over negative one to a different power stuff and so was n factorial over n plus one factorial stuff so so the traditional use of the ratio test is when you have factors and when you have exponential functions, because both factorials and exponential functions are going to give you cancellation. And I mean, we had stuff here that doesn't cancel as well. With the, the n plus one squared over n squared, that doesn't cancel. So it's not a completely hard and fast rule that, you know, you can only use this if you have exponentials and factorials, but that's a good guideline to use. You see a factorial, almost certainly the ratio. Um, you see exponentials, again, ratio test, good thing to try. You don't see any of that, the ratio test is probably not going to, to give you anything useful. Um, I just mentioned this, I mean, the other kind of thing that can happen with the ratio test is you try to use it and you wind up with a limit that you can't uh, do anything with. That happens a lot if you have trig functions. Trig functions really usually don't work well with the ratio S because you got limits that you can't take. And that's, we're actually not done with this section which is exactly where we want to be. Um, this section has two tests in it, the ratio test and what's called the root test. Um, but we're fine. The ratio test is by far the most important of the contests. It's what we're going to use when we start looking at applications. So I wanted to spend more than one day on it. One day we'll do for the root test tomorrow. And then Thursday, one day we'll do to finish the, the next section. The next section is short. So we're right on schedule. Um, some of you'll notice, I mean, these problems, obviously they're taking me longer because I'm trying to ex in every step, but um, I really wouldn't recommend putting the homework off until like Sunday evening. You see these problems can be pretty time consuming. 
now that we've finished the section, I try to get um, get started on this. And I announced this on Canvas, but the deadline I'm holding myself to is that I get stuff graded the week it's due. So the three sections you submitted Sunday should be graded before, well, before this coming Sunday, before the next set of homework is due. And uh, that's a lot of talk, but I guess class is over. I'll, uh, I'll see you on uh, Wednesday.